asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Right, I better introduce my guest again because it's an introduction that is merited. She's um, a journalist of great reputation, incredible experience, Fleet Street investigative reporter and Sunday Times best-selling author. I told author, I told you she reported massive stories that you would have read over the years for the Times, the Sunday Times, the Express, the Guardian, magazines. She went inside the real IRA, drug dealing. We're talking major stories, news of the world, of course. Um, she's interviewed and met people like the Hillside Strangler and the Moore's murderer, Ian Brady. We spoke last year about that and about monarch mind control. Um, and much more besides remarkable woman, a real journalist in an age when we don't have many real journalists. Let's welcome back to the show, Christine Hart, who's at home. Thank God. Chris, you're there. Hi, Richie. Thank you for allowing me time to get back. No, it's great. Thank you. I was just over at the Sun um, building um, dealing with this massive court case that um, Hack Toff are bringing against the Sun Hugh Grant, Elton John, Liz Hurley, um, they're, they're um, using me as a battering ram against uh, against the Sun to try. They're asking for millions um, to be paid out, saying I stole their data. Um, I spied on them in the Priory and I'm a data thief. And, you know, they've put that online and, you know, Professor Cathcart, um who's friends with Hugh Grant, has retweeted it. And, you know, I feel that this is because I've come out and talked about monarch mind control. I mean, I might be wrong, but... And there's also quite a sinister link, uh, Richie, because um, Graham Johnson, who works with Hugh Grant, he's on his payroll, he earns about five grand, and he runs Byline magazine, which is Hacked Off magazine. Um, they were due... I introduced them to albeit um, over Skype to Max Spears and they were um, Graham Johnson was gonna get Channel 4 and some other people to film him at the conference and he was revealing um, a list of pedophiles in Hollywood and just a week I think it was a week or weeks a few weeks before the conference he he turned up dead so I was just writing my my blog I, I, the blog I was telling you about life of a white slave which is on the uh, 4chan um, site at the moment. And I was just writing it and it, it, it was, you know, it sort of popped out of me, that whole thing. I'd never sort of put those two things together. Um, yeah, I can understand why you might think that. And I, I want you to, to go to, to, to go back just for a minute to Hacked Off. I, I just want to remind our listeners, um, we're, we're talking to a lady here who was involved in breaking some of the biggest stories that you'd have read in your Sunday newspapers for years and years. Now, if you go on to YouTube and you want to hear more about Christine, her own channel is on there. You'll find interviews on there uh, that she's conducted with people, interviews that she's done, including with me last year, about her career, how she got into journalism, um, her um, difficult background when she was much younger and all. It's hugely interesting, hugely interesting this. Now, hacked off. Hugh Grant and Liz Hurley and of course to another extent people like Max Mosley and the group Impressed, they want to change I suppose the they want to change the way media operates in this country so Hacked Off are going after the sun saying what Christine, now I know this but a lot of our audience won't know it, saying that what, that the sun was complicit in using nefarious activities and um, doing no, underhand no, it's, it's, it's revolving around me now byline have done an article on this which you can put a link to if you like um they are using me in a case in the high court saying that i spied on liz hurley i spied on elton john and um lily allen a whole host of celebrities when i was in the priory now i was going there and getting hypnosis to reach my childhood and so i had I could go in and out. Sometimes I stayed over, you know, that was over a period of years. Yeah. And basically they've come together to say that I was spying on the celebrities for a, a long period of years. And, and, share, and sharing that with the Sun newspaper, presumably, this is what they're saying. 
No, they sang the Sun newspaper told me directly. Told you to do it, right. Like, go after this one, go after that one, go after that one, um, over a long period um, of time. And there's no truth in this whatsoever, Christine. No, there's no truth in it. I mean, what happened, Graham Johnson, who used to work with me at the News of the World and the Sunday Mirror, he came to me and said, you know, Hugh Grant will do this film and do this, um, you know, on your book about monarch mind control. All you have to do is say that you spied for the sun at the Priory. And I said, well, you know, I didn't. Uh, but he said, well, just say you did. And, you know, there'll be this film with Hugh Grant and Charlize Theron will be playing you. So I kind of went along and, oh, plus 25 grand um, will get deposited immediately in your account. So I kind of went along with it for a little while. What do you mean thought, now? Hang on a second. You know, you know, you know, I love your work, by the way, but I'm going to give you a bit of stick here. What do you mean you went along with it? Did you tell them that you, you, you do it? Or that you would I, say that, that you would say, yes, OK, I did spy on these yes, people. Yes, yes, yes. Why did you do that, a woman with your intelligence? <laughs> I guess Hugh Grant making your movie, Charlie Ceron playing it. I mean, I've already had um, Jane Campion's sister come yeah. after me through a book of for In For The Kill. So I, it wasn't so out of the bounds of possibility because I'd met these two serial killers, Brady yeah. and Bianchi, that there could be a film and I'd had film companies come to me. So for him to say, well, Hugh Grant's read um, Life of a White Slave and wants to make a movie out of it, of course, I just thought, you know, well, yeah, OK, well, he would want to. And it's good. It's got, you know, mind control in it as well as the two series. So I guess I thought, sod the sun. I mean, the sun, I worked for them for about seven years and before that for 10 years for the news of the world. So I was a News International girl and they basically dropped me over um, a really bad investigation into Heather Mills not giving her money to charity. No, it wasn't my investigation. Somebody gave me a, a, a phone and said, oh, you talked to her at the end. And Heather knew that these emails that were going to her were, were from News International. So she ripped into me. Now, I'm not somebody that hangs up on somebody. So she would say, oh, they treat me like Yoko Ono and the press have made me look like a whore. And so I was trying to calm her down because, you know, why not? She was really distressed. And she said, you know, what are they doing to me now? And so I spent half an hour trying to calm her down. And um, basically the son dropped me over that phone call. They said, you were highly unprofessional. You should have just slammed the phone down on her. And that was that. They just disappeared. I mean... Why, Christine? Because the culture in the sun was just to run the story anyway, even if there was no truth in it. You know, in terms of the story about um, okay. Heather Mills, who, just in case our listeners don't know, is a, a, a former model who was married to Paul McCartney and she had an accident many years ago and lost a leg. There was no truth to any of those um, rumours that she was fiddling with charity money. No, 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 no. None. I mean, this, the guy who did it was called Nick Parker, and he thinks of himself as James Bond. And really, he didn't need to send her loads of fake emails. He really didn't need to do that. But he did that. And then he threw me um, a phone and said, you speak to her. She thinks this is um, someone in America. And I thought, well, well this is, it was so ridiculous. And so when she rang, I didn't know what to say. And she said, oh, these fake emails that are from someone in America, they've got News International written all over them. Right. So I just tried to calm her down. Now, I don't know what Nick then said to the son. Um, he's on staff there, but they, they dropped me. So I was feeling bitter towards Nick Parker. I was feeling bitter towards News International. So I suppose when hacked off, um, the MP Evan Harris took me out whining and dining in a French restaurant and, you know, I obviously thought, well, why not say I spied at the Priory? So, you know, I, I guess I did. And then the enormity of it that they were going to demand millions out of the sun hit me and I withdrew. I said, I don't want your money. They already paid me 5000 Um I was supposed to get 25000 So I withdrew. Um, but they had sorted me out this gorgeous house now it was just on the riverside in um a little place near windsor and it was a very remote house and they had you know sorted out the whole thing paid the deposit and i moved in and it was only i think i was there a week and my um someone broke in 
someone broke in, yeah, and took all my computers and all my photographic com equipment, everything went, but not jewellery. So I had a Gucci watch, I had rings, I had gold jewellery, all out where they could see it, you know, as they came and went because the stuff was in my bedroom because I just moved and they didn't touch that. And the CID said it was professional. And I rang, you know, Graham Johnson at the time and I said, it's you, you've taken, you know, you've burgled me because they've got a lot of bent cops work for them. And he said... Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Go on. He said to me, okay. He said to me, he said, oh, just think yourself lucky you and your son haven't been beaten up. It was just scallies. Forget about it. Forget about it. And I just thought, you know, I'm not going to deal with people like this that are so, you know, that are so, I mean, as Brian Harvey knows, I've interviewed him for my show. Yeah, you know, yeah. they threaten, they're hiring Glenn Mulcair, who's just come, who, who, well, he's been out of prison a while now. He's been in prison. Remind so remind I, the audience of who Glenn Mulcair is. Um, we, he's, he's the phone hacker. So, so he went to prison, but now... For the news of the world. Now, I ask you, why are they called hacked off? And they're like, oh, they're so against phone hacking, yet they're hiring the guy who did it. And they're hiring Greg Miskew. I mean, Brian Harvey proved that. I knew it anyway, but he proved that when he confronted him and he's taped it. And you can see that on YouTube. He's, they, they pay um, Greg Miskew, who's the ex-editor to the news. Well, now, why are they so against that? And yet they... Um, are using these people themselves. I don't, that's a good question that, Christine. They might say that they want that expertise because, you know, if Glenn Mulcair went to the dark side, which he obviously did at the News of the World and other people, they might say, well, having people like him on board might enable us to better do what it is we want to do. I'm not saying I buy that at all. I'm just being yeah. devil's advocate, you know, but like you, I'd be worried about it. And I just want to mention, um, Chris has referred to uh, Brian Harvey. Brian, very famously, of course, was a member of East uh, 17 or E17, I think they became, at the end. And he's had his own problems with um, being hacked. I had a couple of private phone calls with uh, Brian at one stage. was was due to, to, to bring him on this programme. But I was concerned about things being said that, um, you know, with the best will in the world and the best intentions in the world um, might be libelous. Uh, on a live show and that's the only reason not not to impugn Brian or what Brian is saying at all I have a lot of sympathy for Brian Harvey and what he's gone through Christine's interview with him by the way is on YouTube and uh, it's well worth a listen there listeners are fascinated that you you're being so honest about it you know they came along to you hacked off and said you've been in the Priory Chris if you say that you did spy on Elton John and Hugh Grant and others well we'll make this film and we'll pay you how serious is that for you now? Is it? I mean, it's very. Is it difficult for you now to turn around and say, "Well, no, I was only doing it because you know I wanted that film to be made and I needed that money." Is are you going to be believed? What does the Sun say, for example? Well, exactly. Well, I, I had a meeting with the Sun, and they they're going to fight them in court. So it is going to go to a court battle. It's going to go to trial as um, the um, legal. Uh, I can't remember his name. Um, Angus. Um, told me just now. Um, so I have to make a, a statement. I guess that, well, Graham Johnson said to me, oh, you were the, um, you were the son's um, spy for um, nearly a decade. So every, <laughs> every time a celebrity or a politician was spied on, it must have been you. So it's probable cause or something like that. So basically, I was reading these thick files and some of the stuff like investigations into Wayne Rooney and yes, yes, I did some of, you know, I did some of those. There was a bit about Liz Hurley. Yes, I did that. I think I did that, you know, as memory, um, if memory will serve me correct. But a lot of the stuff, they're just, you know, picking out stories and, and trying to get, um, trying to get a big pay deck. Well, they yeah. want to close down the sun. I mean, I ha hung out with Evan Harrison, you know, all these people for a long, long time. And they, Max Mosley wants to shut down the Daily Mail. They're very into Paul Dacre. I work for Paul Dacre. I also work for 10 years for um, the Daily Mail. Why specifically, uh, Chris? Let, let's, we, we've got up to the top of the hour, by the way. And, you know, you, you know, once we get to the end of the programme, you can always come back any other evening you want. Um, Christine Hart is live on the line. I've been in radio for years, since the 1990s. And I've known one or two 
people like uh, Chris who have been involved in massive, massive stories. Um, I have a lot of time for Christine Hart, a lot of time for her, but I'm going to say there are one or two people on Twitter that are giving you absolute dog's abuse, Chris. We've had a, a tweet from Les, and uh, I know you've got thick skin. Sorry, Richie, she just sounds like a typical lying mainstream journalist, lying for money and a house. Now, Chris, what about those listening who would say, we know all about Christine Hart. She's been right in the middle of it. How could we believe that Chris was in the Priory with all of these famous people, especially the people you mentioned with all their checkered pasts and the things, you know, their social activities? Why, why, why should we believe that you were there? You, the intrepid journalist with, with the curiosity. I mean, you're the lowest lane of the UK, right? How could we believe that you weren't actually in there and getting stuff on them and taking notes and feeding it back to the tabloids? Go on, Chris. Oh, I see. Is that what that guy meant? Okay, I, I don't lie. I'm too old, tell him. Too old to, too near the grave now, you know? I want to get that when they weigh you up. I want to get the light feather floating up to the sky. I'm not concerned with this life now. I'm too old. I'm going to be on my way out, so I don't lie. No, when I when I was there, I saw so many celebrities. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood, um, that snooker player, uh, Paul Gascoigne, you name it. Uh, Ruby Wax, Robbie Williams, Kate Moss. You name it, I saw them and I met them, but... And they knew who you were, of course. Everybody knew and everybody knows who you are. So they must have been reticent to say anything to you. I would have been anyway. Well, not all of them. I mean, I, I got to know Marty Pello. Um, I got to know Ruby Wax. Not, not all of them. But, you know, if I'd have leaked it back, first of all, it's bad karma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to believe that. Secondly, if they know my story, and I did write it out, I... Did the, I did a blog and it took me hours to get it right and it's on um, I've hung it on an American server because I'm not supposed to talk about this as you know because um, uh, now I'm going to be called as a witness it's called Life of a White Slave now, Yeah I'm going to tweet to... a link to it now Chris go on I'm going to tweet a link to it while you're speaking go on go ahead Thank you if you can find it there and um, because I had been called the devil's daughter now take that into account i had been called the devil's daughter I was 21 years of age now I've never married and I put it back to being called the devil's daughter on the front pages of the newspaper now it details how that happened in that blog but because I had been so shamed by the press and yes later I followed the boyfriend that shamed me in the press into Fleet Street but I always had it in my head that I would never do that to anybody else and that's why I was trying to help Heather Mills I had literally tipped people off when they were under investigation and I certainly if someone's in the Priory getting healed I would not try and ruin that healing by um, abusing it you know fair enough and I've got to say as well people who've succeeded in journalism they understand one there's one absolute I think and that is you can't burn people and burn sources and the likes of Paul Gascoigne in the day and the lead singer of Wet 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 Elton John Hugh Grant these are people who could be very useful to you as a investigative journalist so you're not going to burn these people and I totally understand that now let's talk about what's really important here uh, and of course we're going to follow this case against you and the son with great interest why does Max Mosley and others with this impressed the state recognised regulator why why specifically do they want to get rid of the Daily Mail and the Sun? Now, a lot of our readers here in the Northwest, I would say quite rightly, loathe the Sun because of what it did to the city of Liverpool. And I don't buy it and I wouldn't read it because of that. Maybe I'm a bit pious, maybe, but I wouldn't. But I also understand, to be fair and to be balanced, the Sun and the News of the World, which yourself, of course, and the Daily Mail have done some fantastic fantastic investigative journalism in the best interests of the wider public many times over the years. Why are they going after these particular papers? Why do they want to get rid of them? Um, well, it is Max Mosley, isn't it? I mean, he's the weight behind it. He's putting a lot of money into it. And Hugh Grant. I think Hugh Grant was very hit with that Divine Brown thing. And of course, Max Mosley has been utterly destroyed by them. I mean, recently, because the Daily Mail know that he's trying to come and hit them, they really... I mean, God, they really went to town on him. They dug up all those pictures of him, sea kiling, and I don't know if you saw it, but that went on for a whole week. It was almost eye-watering the way they went after him. I think because he does want to close them down and Hollywood wants to close them down. But I do think there's something sinister behind that. I mean, obviously, I, I, I'm not 
you know, in bed with the sun. They got rid of me. I feel quite bitterly towards them, you know, but I think they should be investigative journalism. Okay, people can say, well, the sun don't do that, but there should at least be some kick-ass newspapers out there or it's just going to be like run by PR. Do you know what I mean? There's not many investigations going on in Fleet Street. You're absolutely right. right. And of course, some of our listeners will know, some of them won't know, but in press, which is state-recognised now, the only state-recognised regulator, they they had or have plans which are ludicrous, whereby publications would pay the legal fees for people who would bring cases against them, even if the newspaper hadn't actually committed libel, defamation, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous that, you know. Well, exactly, and people are saying like you know, like your listeners are saying, we say, oh, we need to get rid of them, get rid, get rid of the news of the world. But the news of the world got under everybody's skin. I would go and see politicians and say, oh, I'm from the news of the world, and I would see terror in their eyes. You know, I mean, you need stuff like that because it keeps people from getting. You know, it keeps yeah. from things like human trafficking you know, paedophilia. It Here's a question for you now. Here's the question. But let me just r- remind our listeners, Christine Hart is live. I've tweeted a link to the blog that Christine was talking about there. It's out there and uh, it's a fantastic read. Life of a White Slave. Read it. It's uh, There's a bit of reading in it, but read it. She's obviously a brilliant writer, Chris, so it reads incredibly well. It's basically her story. Listen, tell me this, right? I think we might have touched on this last year. Chris, how did these people not get Savile? How did these people not get Edward Heath and many others? Greville Janner, um, you know, deceased uh, now, uh, Janner, allegedly, I would say. How did they not get these people? That's Look, I, that's not it's nothing to do with you, of course, but you worked with some of these um, people who might well have known about institutional endemic paedophilia. Why was it not splashed all over the news of the world? I suppose it was a cover-up at a higher level, I would say. Don't you agree? Pressure was brought to bear on the editors, the people at the very top of those newspapers, not to go there, yeah, basically. of course, because it's not, you know, it's not the news editors. They might say, oh, let's do this, let's do that. But at the end of the day, it, you know, the paper is run by the editors, so and the editors under pressure by the government. So you can't really, you know, they, they are really controlled. There was some that, you know had a bit of kick to them, like the news of the world, but they're trying to get rid of them. So uh, it's only going to get darker, you know, it's not going to... Especially with the way things are going. So do you think, and look, I'm I'm not putting words in your mouth, and if you want to change the direction of this and talk, I mean, I want to talk a bit about mind control now as well. But if, if you want to move away from this, because it's only speculation, and maybe I shouldn't be speculating, but looking back now, I mean, the the work of people like um, David Icke and and others over the years to bring into the light the scale of, I suppose, establishment paedophilia. It's it's not unfair to speculate that some of, and we're not going to name anybody, of course, because we don't know, but some of the country's newspaper editors, not just the tabloids, but the broadsheet editors, some of them must have been in regular contact with the intelligence agencies who must have been saying to them, these are areas you don't go down. I can only conclude that. I don't know what your opinion is. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, I dated Phil Hall when I was young and Phil Hall rose to um, News of the World editor, the overall editor. And I, you know, one time, just I was in the office late and I went into his office and looked through his diary and he met Tony Blair. I mean, you know, he was meeting him. He was like, Tony, that week I saw meet Tony Blair for breakfast and then flick through his diary, and there was, oh, meet Tony Blair this day. I mean, they're literally controlled by, and of course, the the security services, all the um, crimes on that newspaper and on the Daily Mail, they were all meeting with security services regularly. So there's, you know, there's a, a massive bond there. I mean, almost to say they're one and the same, you know? It's a terrible thing for people to hear, isn't it? But, you know, it's vital that there's somebody like you, especially somebody with your experience and the levels that you reach, to have the courage to say that. Because we often hear it. How could they get away with it for so long? And Mm. collusion is the answer. But, again, it's easy to beat up the newspapers, and everybody likes to beat up the newspapers. But those conversations were also being had with detectives 
and with chief superintendents at police stations around London. And we know this because um, retired detectives and police officers have said that they were told, you don't go down that road, you don't go down that road, um, you've got some information about this, don't follow it any further, nothing is going to come of it. So it's not a newspaper thing, it's an establishment thing in uh, in, in general, I would say. But um, yeah, I mean, the Savile, yeah. Savile thing is never going to go away in terms of people wondering, how did he get away with it? You, you know, you would get Fleet Street and there would be investigations going on, there would be investigative journalists. But now, the way they've got Fleet Street, and if hacked off have their way, it will be even tighter. You know, you, you get graduates in there and they're taught that things are a certain way. They're not taught to be investigative journalists because there's no investigations going on. So they're taught, you know, just to read the PA, just to kind of get their MI5 contacts and sort of just say what, you know, they're not taught to think out of the box where a story could get out. So Fleet Street has been changed now and it's going to get even more sewn up to a point where it's just full of these people that don't even think outside the box. They're just really, so it's just, you know, full government control. So nothing will be getting out. So the Independent is gone from print. The Guardian is struggling. I know they're broadsheets. The Daily Mail is very successful because of its online platform, which is hugely, so I think it's the biggest online news bureau in the world, I think, Daily Mail Online. It's absolutely huge, massively successful, brings in huge revenues for them. What you're saying there is very disturbing. You don't believe there are, there are any Christine Hearts anymore. There aren't people out there chasing down leads, you know, leads about people in positions of authority, leads that will help to expose people, corruption, sleaze. They're just not there, Chris, anymore, basically. Those journalists. No, not there. Well, you're not allowed to use subterfuge anymore to get in places. You're not allowed to pretend things, you know, in the old style. I don't know, like if you watch the film Angel Heart and you see the guy, you know, trying to sort of talk to the receptionist and sort of use a pretext. I mean, using that as an example. You can't do that anymore. That's against the law. So how can you find out anything if you can't, you know, do the odd subterfuge you won't find out anything i mean for example one time they were using heathrow airport as a as a morgue you know when it was the millennium and they thought everything was going to fail and they had <laughs> um ice rinks everywhere and they were on alert from the government that they were going to be morgues because they thought everywhere was going to crash and um i remember somebody tipped me off about that and i was trying to stand it up and to stand it up i had to then flag the um a few of the ice rings to get the story it, so i used pretext and i i got the story now that's a, a silly little story it shows you where they the government think anyway they thought the whole place is gonna crash down but you know real things if, if you're investigating you have to use subterfuge obviously of course you do because everybody knows christine hart and they're not going to talk to you and there might be something that's vital in terms of it needs to be out there for the public interest. So why shouldn't you say, well, in fact, it's Mary Murphy here and I'm calling from whatever, from the funeral directors yeah, or whatever or, the hell, or, you know. Or, or undercover work, yeah. they're not doing that anymore, you know, about sort of mistreating animals and stuff like that. How can you go undercover somewhere and film somebody, you know, when, when they don't have that on fleets? No, we're not doing that anymore. I mean, and then they... Oh, I don't know. It's just, it's just bad. And it's all put down, you know, groups that have off saying, oh, it's just to protect celebrities and just protect us. But, you know, that's part of being a celebrity, isn't it? And who really, I just think because of who it's run by, because it's linked to Hollywood, but they just don't want us to know absolutely anything that's going on. Of course they don't. One of the things that is really interesting now, of course, and we, we, we spoke about this last year, and I know you believe this, while what happened to the family of Millie Dowler is terrible and nobody would dispute that and while people having their phones tapped to hear their personal messages is wrong, you, I think, concluded, I think you hinted at that last year to me, well, more than hinted, that this is like the kind of problem-reaction-solution scenario. These cases are being used to create a kind of a public outrage to bring about more and more constraints on the freedom of the press. So basically, it's a kind of a state false flag, this. I think you believe that now, Chris, is that right? Oh, yeah, I totally believe it. You know, I think I, I shared with you about John Boyle, and I've written about him yeah. in the article. I don't have a picture, so I've used Dirk Bogard. Now, the reason why I used Dirk Bogard is he looked like him, and he's got, 
you know, he's aristocratic like him. So you're talking about a public school boy. I just wanted people to see um, what had gone on. Now, I brought him into the news of the world. He brought in the hacking. Um, and he was never mentioned. I mean, Nick Davies, who wrote the book about it, there's no mention. It's all about, oh, Glenn Mulcair, you know, he, he's brought in the phone hacking. It's really bad and let's tighten up. But I believe, and as I've written in the blog, um, that it was a setup that Boyle brought it in. Now, Boyle works for MI6. Okay? And he was your ex-boyfriend. You met him when you were 19, I think. Yes. And he was your ex-boyfriend, MI6, and you introduced him to the news of the world. You're certain this guy was heavily involved in the operation to, you know, set this whole false flag phone hacking up. And yet, as you said, the guy doesn't get nary a mention at all now. Well, he, he was the one who trained Glenn Mulcair, who everybody knows as a hacker. Glenn Mulcair was his office boy. So basically, he gave them the phone hacking. Boyle gave them the phone hacking. They took it on board. He charged £5,000 a pop or something like that. They they then craftily nicked his office boy, who would do it for peanuts. And then, of course, he screwed up because they were hacking the royal family because he wasn't a private investigator and he didn't know anything about it. He didn't know any better. So he was doing all that. But... OK, so that's fine. Fair enough. So why didn't Nick Davies from The Guardian, why didn't he then profile John Boyle? Why didn't all the newspapers at the time profile and say, well, this is the guy who masterminded hacking. The other guy is just chicken feed. Here's the guy in his eight million pound ma mansion. But there was and I know Nick Davies was um, investigating John Boyle because he kept asking me questions. What is he like? You know, what clubs did he go to? Because he used to go to those rubber leather uh, skin two clubs and blah de blah so you know, I was telling him all this and he said oh I've got hold of somebody um, he used to go to cocaine parties with him so I thought when his book comes out it's going to be a massive expose there was absolutely nothing absolutely I think there was one line about him nothing where, oh, so you had Nick Davis from the Guardian going after Boyle um, yeah. collating all this information on him you yeah. gave it to him as you should do and the yeah. book comes out and nothing, nothing. about Boyle Nothing. And, you know, I've had a word with a BBC journalist I know um, who's quite senior and they said they were going to do a documentary on board. Anyway, um, years passed and I, I said, well, what about that documentary? And they said, no, he's an untouchable, untouchable. Now, you presume, I, I, I'm guessing anyway, no better woman than you. Did you speak to Nick Davies after that to say, hey, listen, what's going on with your book? I gave you everything you needed to know about John Boyle. Yes. I did. And, you know, he even covered up me in the book. He called me York when he could have called me by my name. And I said to him, um, you know, you could have called me um, Christine. I didn't mind that. So he's covered up the link there with Boyle um, because he knows I talk about it. And I said to him, you know, I emailed him and I said, you know, why didn't you do that? There's going to be a film. You got paid by George Clooney. I think he's living in Hollywood now. So he got paid. He's certainly retired. He got paid by George Clooney. Um, to do a film and I said well you haven't got the real story about it you know you're just going to get this private eye this footballer private eye what about who's behind it and my six are behind it what about that and he said oh I, I mentioned Boyle in my book I said one line and then he sent me an email back going no he's on page 190 he's on this page and I looked at it but they were just little mentions it could have been Joe Bloggs and the way he said it it sounds like it's Joe Bloggs so you don't really read it you know it's just a token mention and so that is what makes me think Richie that it was a setup by the state oh I know what do we do we um bring in this and then we'll be able to close down that newspaper I mean it's very easy do you know what do you know, it is do you know what Chris it it coincides with this Orwellian attack on language I was listening to Stuart Waiton yesterday whom you might not have heard of he's a He's a Scottish academic who's in the middle of writing a book called The Criminalisation of Everything. And they want to try and outlaw homophobic chanting at football. So if groups of guys are pissed up and they're singing a song and it might be derogatory towards gay men and women, they want to criminalise that, resulting in repeat offenders going to prison. Now, look, I'm not trying to virtue signal here, but I don't want to be sitting next to some guy who's singing stupid songs about gay people. I don't particularly want to hear that because I couldn't care less whether you're straight, gay, bisexual. It doesn't matter to me. But I don't want to put people in prison because they say stuff. There's a massive, massive... It's like the ceiling is coming down on exactly. free speech, well, what, isn't it? What about, Richie? Well, Tommy, um, Tommy Robinson, he got put in prison for, for nothing. Then there was a the guy, Jez Turner. He was a, a man that had served in the British Army. 
he was outside Downing Street and he said something about, oh, something, something, the Jews shouldn't be welcome here, whatever, make them go somewhere. But really, you know, he served in the army. I mean, free speech. He's in prison now for a year along with Tommy Robinson. You can't jail people for that. I'm going to say this though, Chris. I haven't, oh, I haven't much sympathy for Stephen Lennon, Tommy Robinson. I've known him a long time. And listen, that doesn't make me right. Uh, by all means, um, shout me down and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, the only reason that I, I don't have any sympathy for him is um, I looked at that very carefully. And he did, um, not not once but twice, bring a trial very close to where it could have been declared a mistrial. He wanted to film not only the defendants of this um, uh, this Muslim grooming gang, but he also was trying to film the jury. And worse than that, he was saying on camera that he was going to go around to these people's houses. The guy, he's not for me. But that's just my opinion. If you want to put a counter opinion to that, go I ahead. Didn't, I didn't know that. Um, he's so a plonker. It's, not a, free, it's not a free speech issue, I don't believe. I think oh, he, right, genuinely, okay. he genuinely oh. could have caused a mistrial. Go ahead. What about this poor British Army guy, Jez, Jez, um, Jez Turner? In totally prison agree for... with you. Totally agree with you. Crazy. I I don't think people should be in in, in prison for, for, for crimes that aren't violent. Certainly not saying something. I mean, people bash single mothers. They do that all the goddamn time. Single mothers are this, single mothers are that. Oh, yeah, they're, they're this. We have to put up with it. So, yeah. I mean, come on. I'm going to say this, Chris. You're absolutely right because... You see, because we've talked about Robinson now, I'll get trolled unmercifully tomorrow <laughs> by his fans, right? Now, of course, I, I've no problem with that because I've, I've been around a long time. I've got very thick skin. But what some of his idiotic supporters can't seem to understand, I have no problem with Robinson being in London, blaming Muslims for everything. I have no problem with that. I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him. He can say whatever he wants. I would not see Robinson locked up for saying that Islam is trying to take over the world and the grooming gangs and all this. Say whatever. I have no problem with that. But when you've got a bunch of guys actually in on trial at a cost of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands to the state, and this fool is outside trying to film them and saying stuff when he was told not to do it, I'm not sure that's a free speech issue. But look, the other case you talked about, you're absolutely right, Chris. We're seeing an attack on independent media. We're seeing an attack on thoughts. You're not supposed to think stuff anymore. You know, it's almost like... Exactly. Yeah. And it, doesn't it correspond with this? I mean, someone mentioned yeah. the book Douglas Murray, The Death of Europe. And doesn't it... I think it's an attack. I'm not saying just because I'm white. And I did call that blog life as a white slave to see, you know, I mean... Isn't it a sort of they, they want to sort of get rid of the white man? I mean, I, I do think they do want to get rid, rid of the white man. I, I, I do. Well, I think it's, it's funny you say that. I, I would have laughed at that in the past. I would have been very much, you know, I would have been very, I suppose a bit smugger would have been. And I would have said, yeah, fair enough, Chris. And then probably when you weren't looking, I'd probably say, well, that's just a bit ridiculous, that. But, <laughs> but listen, I, I, I've been lucky enough in recent months to speak to academics on the left and on the right, and they talk about the fact that, you know, everything about white Christians is fair game for mocking, for ridiculing, for lampooning, and for satirising, which, of course, I have no problem with. However, it's not the same when you're dealing with minority cultures. And there is a huge problem with that. Minority cultures are protected from criticism, from scrutiny, um, from satire, from lampooning. Um, but, you know, indigenous cultures... Uh, let's let's just say white Christians. Well, you can say whatever you want about them. You can insult them. You can insult their religion. Insult the way they go about their business. Insult who they are. No problem. But you can't do it with minority cultures. And I'll give you that. I think you're absolutely spot on. But that's part of an, a divide and rule agenda, isn't it? And it's not necessarily the fault of the minority cultures. That's no, coming no, no. from somewhere I, deeper. I think the Muslims are, are being used by the elite Absolutely. who are making this planet even uglier yeah. day by day. The Muslims are being used to to just beat. They're being used, really, you know, um, to sort of. They want, I think, a Christian versus Muslim war and us all to destroy each other. Really, I think they'll be happy and they'll bring in laws that we'll all have to probably be in curfew. And I just think things will get more and more, you know. Um, violent until they have us totally under control and i don't know if you've seen richie um that handmaiden's tale not so yet you know, but I, uh, yeah i heard it's brilliant chris go ahead i heard it's great yeah the one the series with elizabeth moss and 
I just think, you know, that we're not really far off that now. And I know they, they kind of made it look like, oh, it was Christians running things and they're the bad guys. But I just kind of, the way they portrayed the elite, it made them seem like they weren't really human. They were just vessels. And I think really that's the problem that a lot of people on the planet aren't actually human. They're just vesseled up by whatever we're under attack by, you know, whether it's archons or, or what. But the ones that have got control of the steering wheel aren't actually human. They're like these controllers in that handmaiden's tale. And the way they were with the others, you know, the way the way they've done that, it's just so chilling because you can see it's just around the corner. Well, you know, my friend, on that, my friend and colleague, Jean Ann Crowley, who is an Irish actress very well known for films like Educating Rita and worked for RTE as a journalist for many years, she reminded me of something that I said the other day. I wrote an article the other day about this silencing speech, even speech that we disagree with. Now, Chris, you never got to the heights that you reached in journalism without being able to develop a thick skin, without being able to be criticised, without having your ideas challenged and yet to fight for your ideas. We're moving into this world now where we're, we're moving towards self-censorship because the system is telling us all the time that you can't say this, you can't think that, it's wrong. I was writing the other day and I'm not a writer at all and I'm not fishing for compliments here. I'm not a writer. I just, stream of consciousness comes out and I post it. And I was, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how we now are thinking all the time about the impact of what we are going to say rather than just saying it. And I was reading Quentin Letts in the Daily Mail and he wrote about this uh, Shakespeare season in London at um, one of the theatres and how in um, uh, one of the Shakespearean plays they're using a deaf actress who's signing the lines. I think it might be um, in As You Like It maybe. And uh, I, I could be wrong, though. I, I mean, my mind's gone a bit blank now. And my instinct is to go, well, that's just taking the piss. That's just putting somebody who's deaf, however good this girl might be, into a position just for the sake of it. Shakespeare didn't write the character as deaf. Um, why do I want to see somebody signing it? And I did write it, but I thought about it. It, it is, it's Celia in As You Like It. And I thought about not writing it, Chris, in case I offended somebody. And, oh, there's, yeah. and well, there's nothing offensive about what I was saying. I'm not yeah. anti-deaf people. I just thought it was ridiculous. Why put a deaf girl in that role? Celia wasn't deaf. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It's mad, isn't it? It's crazy. It is. And it just makes us, it, sh it stops us from being human because humans are, you know, we do say mean things. We do act badly, you know, but that's how we grow, isn't it? That's how we grow our souls from from saying stupid things and, you know, but if they're going to censor us and how can we grow and, and mature, we're just going to keep it all in and just become like not humans, not growing really, I think. I think you're absolutely right. And it's a point made by the academic yesterday, uh, Stuart Wayton, when he said football fans don't mean what they sing. They're idiots. They're looking to say the most offensive things to get under the skins of players who can't even hear them. Because, I mean, I never played sport in front of any you know large numbers of people but I, I've, I've interviewed a lot of football players and I know you have Chris when you're out there they say you can't hear a bloody thing anyway so you've got guys saying stuff that they actually don't mean and by and large over the years there's always people there in the majority who say to guys hey listen catch yourself on will you stop saying that Stop saying that. There's a child here who doesn't need to hear that. And by and large, people will say, fair enough, and they'll move on. We don't need people to criminalise that sort of stuff and put people in prison. Now, because it's 25 to the top of the year and we've only got about 18 to 20 minutes left, I want to take this in a 180-degree turn, Chris, because when you were on the show last year, you blew people's minds talking about your conversations with Kenneth Bianchi, who we know, of course, as the Hillside Strangler. Now, folks, if you've just joined the programme, um, Christine Hart is live with me from London, uh, a rare breed, uh, a real journalist responsible for breaking some of the biggest stories that you'll have read in the last 15, 20 years. Terrific writer. I've tweeted out a link to a recent blog where Chris talks about her life, uh, bringing it up to date. Now, we talked earlier about how the hacked off group are coming after the son and Christine alleging that when Christine was herself in the Priory that she was basically feeding information to the son about some of the celebrities in there. Christine says she didn't do it. We talked all about that. Um, 
we'll, 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 we'll of course follow that up later on at another stage and we hope it goes well for Christine. Now, you talked about Kenneth Bianchi. Am I right? Because I didn't listen back to our previous conversation today. The reason I didn't listen back to it is because I've not got much going for me, but I've got a decent memory and I remember the conversation we had. Remote viewing and possession and mind control, was your conversations with the Hillside Strangler, was that your introduction to that, Chris? Um, no, it, it was, was back. Pardon? It goes back to even when you were younger, does it? When you were, um, maybe when you were um, in your childhood, because I remember your story. But it's this, it's this mind control, demonic possession, and this kind of remote viewing that absolutely gripped me. It gripped David Icke and everybody else who was listening. Sorry, anyway, I'll shut up. Carry on. Go ahead. Oh no, that's okay. No, I had written a book. I had, you know, um, basically visited Brady when I was young. I grew up in an orphanage, a Jesuit run orphanage um i was adopted at five but then it didn't work out so i went back when i was 13 and basically um you know i was brought up in the catholic religion with these um clergy and i then worked for um an xmi6 agency military um there was a student at the home and he said you know they want young girls to go undercover so i basically joined them and i just did you know private investigations work nothing really exciting we did some spying on politicians and people making movies that they shouldn't have done and then I went from that into um, working on Fleet Street and then I brought in the phone hacking and then when I was on Fleet Street I did a lot of work getting close to one of the leaders of the real IRA you know very very close yeah yeah I remember and, that um, I, I, I wrote a book um, about meeting Ian Brady about the real IRA relationship about working on Fleet Street and about meeting Kenneth Bianchi. And it was when I published him for The Kill that um, a woman called Anna, and I've written it the other way around in my blog because it just, um, you know, it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she came to me and she said that she believed that I was a monarch slave. Now, I said to her, well, what's that? And I thought, oh, it's just like American strangeness and no such thing. And she put me in a Facebook group and uh, she was a friend of Fritz Springmeier. She put me in a Facebook group and I got talking to the other girls in there about, you know, the fact I'd never been able to access my childhood memories. And Dr. Collins in the Priory was trying to help me do that. And she said to me, oh, is it a screen? And I said, yeah, there's a screen there. She goes, well, what's on the screen? There must be something on there. And I said, Donald Duck. Yeah, said, yeah, I remember now, yeah. Disney yeah. Uh, program. And I didn't believe her, but then over time, I kind of recognize, especially um, when I was with the real IRA commander in Dundalk and Cross McGlenn, as you know, it's a no-go area for strangers. I push myself as a reporter. I push myself to have a sexual relationship with him. Um, and he noticed that he felt I was two people. He said, you're like two people. One is scared, like scared of me and nervous and quite depressing and moody. And I don't like her. Well, that's the, the real me. <laughs> and the other one is wild and, you know, sexual and devil may care. And that's the one I like, which, you know, I noticed that at certain points, especially certain times when I was getting into Fleet Street, um, whether I got in there just to bring in the phone hacking, I don't know. But I when I got in there, I noticed that this part of me was was present and it could do things like remote view. It could um, find out things psychically. I can do past lives. Um, I can touch something and know where the person's been, um, things like that. And she said to me, Anna said to me, that that is what they put into us. And of course, I've read Russ Dizdar's um, stuff on Chosen Ones and Satanic, um, Satanic Super Soldiers. He's done a whole thing on it. And he believes that in these orphanages, they get the Catholic orphans and they traumatize them. So their minds split and then they hypnotize a part of them so it can be um like um triggered so they would um split me by causing me trauma and i was sexually abused by my adoptive father and when they took me from the orphanage they had to bring me back twice a year and it was for parties i always remember but they didn't seem like parties because all the kids were there and it just seemed like we were all lining up all the time and going in these little rooms and then we were given lots of jelly and ice cream and I was told to focus on the jelly and ice cream. 
but I remember crying when I came away and just just feeling like horrible and so they never really let go of us we were theirs and they've got they keep files on us they've got a file on me and she said that basically they traumatize you and they get the one of the parts which is the core part and they kind of own it so they drench it with hypnotism they attach um, demonic entities so it can, or one demonic en entity so it has psychic gifts and that is what they use to control you so what you've got left is not what you should have always had what you um, have to live life with is something that isn't the whole you it's just a part and I had always noticed that I mean I haven't I don't own my sexuality I don't I'm not sexual and um, I haven't got common sense but when that part comes into me I'm like you know I, I'm, I'm psychic I, I don't fear anything I have my sexuality but it was only targeted for certain things like enter fleet street go and um liaise with the head of the real ira have a sexual relationship with him do the stories but you know was that the real reason i was there according to these people um who are studying this monarch mind control that they um use the girls whether i'm one or not i suppose you can never say for sure but i certainly feel fit the bill um they have a certain group of them that kind of when they have sex with the man, when he kind of, you know what, they um, download information off the, his skin and then they pass it back to somebody else by having sex with them on their skin. Now, I don't know how true that is. I don't know. So, I mean, when I wrote that blog piece, I kind of posed the, yeah. the question because can you ever prove that? I mean... It's very difficult to prove it, but exactly. But it's out there, and it is out there. It is out there, out and there, the yeah. cure. They say that I mean James Casbolt, who I wrote write to, he's in prison at the moment for twelve years for doing not very much. Max Spears, who came out and talked about it, also he was a friend of mine. He came on my show many times, and he was a personal friend. He's dead, and they do. They don't really want the real ones out there. There's a lot of there's a lot of them, you know, talking about it, and they're not. You can tell they haven't had it done to them. So they're saturating like YouTube with, oh, this happened to me. And they're not actually real because, and then people think, oh, I've heard that before and I'm not very interested. It seems like hokum. I mean, it does even for me, having experienced that seems like hokum. Well, but anything it, anything that people have never heard before is, yeah. is obviously going to sound you know, yeah. off the wall or out of the blue, but exactly. people, but, but people but need to search does, there. It does, in, it does involve the occult. It, it, it is the yeah. occult. They use hypnotism. They also use spells. So really, I think the only person that I've found is really good at talking about it is Russ Dizdar. But then Russ Dizdar seems to think that people like that are here for a black awakening that at, at some point they're going to all be triggered. So they all rise and begin helping to imprison the others to make this a prison planet i mean so he really demonizes and goes after them um but i've offered to go on his show and um have him you know say and, prayers cha and, and challenge him. and challenge his um assertion that that basically people like you are basically basically a sleeper cell that's what he's saying basically a giant sleeper a giant cell. sleeper cell yeah well satan no less well, you know, I, I'm convinced of the of the existence of these programs, not because I want to be and not to curry favour with my audience, because I've spoken to enough people over the years, credible, intelligent, intellectual people like yourself, I have no doubt about it. I mean, it must be sad in some ways for you, because to think that maybe a program like that could have been put on you and, you know, that you, you, you could have been pushed into avenues and pushed down, pushed into certain places and pushed into certain jobs, because... At the same time, Chris, you know, you're an absolutely outstanding writer. You've done some absolutely brilliant and vital journalism over the years. And that must be, a, you know, a bit of a conflict for you thinking that, you know, that you're pushed into places to do things and do stories. The fact is, a lot of the stories that you were involved with breaking were very important stories in the public interest and would have been stories that maybe the deep state wouldn't have wanted to come out. So what an absolute paradox that is for you, I suppose. Yeah, it is. I mean, after I wrote that blog and I just did it over the weekend and I posted it yesterday and I felt massive amounts of sadness 
And a friend of mine said to me in Messenger, it's because of the level of betrayal. You're betrayed a lot, you know. And I did feel the sadness. And I think I felt that, you know, there was the looking for Jane, you know, the psychic telling me that I would meet a Jane who would be, you know, the love of my life. And I looked for that person as well. And I just noticed the things like that, you know, the stupidity of somebody being told by a psychic, oh, you're going to meet this man called Jane. He's going to be the one for you. The stupidity of of pushing away normal men, holding out for Jay. And I noticed a kind of childlikeness. And I think that if that was done to me, the thing that I feel most bitter about is not having my whole persona so I could mature, that I've only had a part of me that has been... Obviously, I've got trauma because of the sexual abuse, but just having a part of me and having to go through life like being disabled, but nobody seeing it, but limping through life and ending up with nothing. Like I don't own property and um, I didn't marry and to end up, you know, middle aged and to have nothing. Um, it does make me feel sad, you know, to not have a husband. And but I didn't have my sexuality. I mean, my sexuality was just like a switch that came outside me and then I'd be flooded and it would be like, oh, leader of the real IRA, got to go and get close. And then soon as he went to prison, it turned off, you know, and it makes me sad that I never had my sexuality to give to a man and I've ended up married and living in a house, normally going into, you know, middle age and feeling that they've got something. Now I'm middle-aged and I'm, thinking, you know, how am I going to support myself? I'm in rented, you know, I've got my son. And that makes me feel really, really sad that I didn't really have my life the way I should have done. But it's not, from me, this is not a, a throwaway line. It's not an own goal. You've given me an own goal, but it isn't an own goal. But you're not an old woman, Chris. I mean, you you know, you've got um, your, your son is on the way to growing up. You're an attractive woman, incredibly intelligent. Well, who's to say that you can't have that life, have that companionship, that you'll meet somebody and your life will take a completely different direction? Uh, you know, I, you because of everything you've been through and um, the positivity that you've exhibited here today and when I've spoken to you previously, I wouldn't be pessimistic about having whatever type of life you want to have, surely you can have it. Yeah, I suppose so. I do find it difficult to be attracted to men, you know, because I've had that sort of thing where my sexuality has been from the outside. I find it, I sort of panic. So I will sort of, you know, maybe go for a date and not feel that. I mean, that feeling of sexuality coming through you, it's just like really, really strong. And to not have that, I immediately think, oh, I don't fancy him, I don't fancy him, is he going to kiss me and, you know, right. I'll never be able yeah, to yeah. sleep with him. Becomes negative, and yeah. I don't let things grow um, in their normal way and I sort of panic about panic about that, I suppose. I need someone really, really old who doesn't, <laughs> who doesn't like sex <laughs> Somebody anymore. With patience. <laughs> Somebody with patience. But, you, well, I suppose, look, who who knows? You know, I, I, I obviously wasn't sexually abused but when you, you make programs like this and even I worked in obviously commercial and national media for a long time you meet a lot of people who've been through the horrors of sexual abuse and one of the questions that comes up especially with survivors not with recent survivors or where it's very fresh because it's a very impertinent question but when you're speaking to somebody who has um, you know a decade or two or more away from it it's not so impertinent to say how do you get on with romance and relationships you know because I often I feel very sorry for people who are sexually abused and intimacy it must be very difficult for people you know maybe maybe I'm wrong to think that time is a great healer maybe time is not a great healer what the hell no, do I bloody know you know great healer I mean yeah it's impossible you know if, if I meet someone and I get on with them and you know they start being sexual I immediately think oh this seems like incest and I don't know why that is because it shouldn't really fit, but it does. I start thinking, oh, I like them like a brother. And, you know, it's sort of, somebody said to me, but that it's bringing up pain, but it's bringing up the pain 
of your father and so it does feel even though he wasn't real to me he was my real father so it, it it's like painful and my brother was sexually abusive and to me he was my real brother so I basically was bombarded with that as a kid so now feeling sexuality I, I think oh incest and it's sort of linked with that and then you feel icky and then you think oh I don't want to you know don't want to do this so it is difficult I mean it really is actually it really is yeah, I can't speak to it. Had issues with physical abuse as as a as a very young boy that were difficult, and it left me with issues, obviously abandonment issues, but also, of course, um, issues of trusting people and stuff. And um, but nothing like what what you had to endure. Just before we run out of time, we've only got about two minutes left. You're welcome back anytime you want, of course, and we shouldn't leave it eight or nine months or ten months before you come back again. I'd be delighted to have you back as soon as you want to come back. But you mentioned Max Spears. I never met Max. I'd heard about him. It was something that I would have liked to do. I would have liked to have him on the programme, of course. But I did interview his mum, uh, Vanessa. And, um, she, you know, she came across as a lovely lady a couple of oh. times. I know you know her. You oh. remain convinced, Chris, that he was seriously on to some pretty bad people. And that's how he came to meet his end. That's what you think. Yeah, I do, for sure. For sure he was murdered. For sure he was lured out there to Poland where, you know, it wasn't England, he wasn't safe, he wasn't amongst um, his family. And he was lured out there somewhere far away, somewhere remote, and killed. Yeah, I do, for sure. He was just about to speak at that conference, you know, and he had something to reveal there and he was really excited about it. Miles Johnson, who ran the conference, kept saying, oh, I don't want Max there, um... You know, I'm, I'm having people that are going to talk about UFOs. And Max begged me to um, get Miles to let him speak there, which I did. It took me a long time. And then I'd go back and tell Max and then speak to Miles Johnson about arrangements. And Miles would say, oh, I'm not having Max there. And it did my head in a little bit. But I finally got it where Max was speaking. And he was absolutely over the moon. And he said, I'm going to do a brilliant thing. I've got loads of stuff. I'm going to reveal something really, really big. And um, it's going to be really exciting. And he died just just before that, you know. I mean, Graham Johnson was involved in that. He was going to um, he was going to film. He said he was going to bring um, Channel Four and film the uh, conference. He was going to speak. He said we're very interested in, in Max. And of course, when he died, all of a sudden, um, the people that were coming, oh, Graham said, no, 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 I'll just send Vice along. So they sent. Graham sent Vice along and Vice did this silly little film about um, people that were targeted. And it was really, it was just quickly filmed. Um, it, it should be treated as a serious subject, but they, they filmed it really badly, you know, rather than filming it well and listening more to the people. It was done cheaply. It was done on a budget. I think they must have sent a junior. And all the filming they did um, around it, preparing it just, you know, they were going to do something on Max and that was, was bin. So I don't know where they linked to it. I Who knows? But um, I, I just, I'm pretty sure he was murdered. You know, I mean, why would he just die? If he had information about people operating in his own country, namely here, you think going abroad into Eastern Europe, this is in no way now to criticise the Polish authorities or anything like it. Their police... And their authorities are, you know, just as competent or just as incompetent as they are here or anywhere else. But it's the sort of thing agencies do, isn't it? You know, when they're away from their base, from their home, from their friends. And he would have had a lot of friends who write blogs and who make programs. You have to think that maybe, yeah, you know, maybe he was about to reveal something. And maybe somebody thought that's not such a good idea because the circumstances are terrible around a death terrible exactly exactly and he was really good at speaking i mean he, he was really good i think he would have gone on to to do amazing stuff he had a great heart you know i mean look at james casbolt he's in prison um for 12 years i don't know how many he's done now maybe five years he's done so far i mean what what was that for i i know he was saying he was going to put his his ex wife on a naked picture on Facebook. Does that really deserve twelve years? I mean, no, it doesn't. No. And plus, he was written about in the Daily Mail. Oh, he's a major fantasist. 
did it need that as well? I mean, it's really odd. Why did he hit the newspapers like that? It's, it's, it's not a big case, but he did. And why is he doing 12 years? And why is Max Spears dead? You have to look at, you know, these people that that were linked to that monarch mind control. Max Spears believed he, he'd had it done on him. Um, James Casbolt believed he'd had it done on him. They often end up dead. We come back full circle. And the reason why it's so difficult to expose this is because of an answer you gave earlier on, because the Christine hearts of this world don't exist anymore. And when you don't have investigative journalism, and when you don't have young men and women supported by an editor to go and genuinely look into this stuff, this is where you have a problem. We're out of time, so first of all, good luck with Hacked Off and this nonsense, and I hope this goes away. Um, very quickly and in the meantime maybe when the youngsters have gone back to school and it's a bit cooler in the autumn um, get come back on don't leave it any later than that with your permission and let's get into these areas again Chris because um, yours is an important voice and I really enjoyed uh, hearing from you again tonight on that we covered a lot of ground and um, give a plug Chris to um, your YouTube channel and your website quickly before we run out of time there yeah um, I'd like everyone to read the book Life uh, sorry the blog I wrote, just I did it over two days. It's called Life of a White Slave. And there is such a thing as white slavery. You do concentrate on black slavery. Everyone concentrates on black slavery. But there is such a thing as white slavery. So please read that. And you can find me on Facebook under Christine Hart. Brilliant. I've put a link out to it. Marvellous to have you back, Thank uh, Chris. You. Thanks for your, for coming on and for giving us your time. And like I said, I look forward to doing it again. Look after Thank yourself you. now. Thank you, Richie. God bless. Cheers to you too, Chris. Bye for now. Right, that's a brilliant stuff. Chris Hart there, Christine Hart.